Norse mythology is rich with adventure, tragedy, and even horror. If you think the usual monsters and spirits are nightmare-worthy, just wait and see what Nordic countries like Sweden, Finland, Iceland, Greenland, Denmark, and Norway have to offer. Prepare yourself for stories that will have even Thor himself spooked for a night or two. These are seven allegedly real Nordic ghost stories. Be sure to share your own story with us at darknessprevails.org, and you can always hang out with us on my Discord via the link in the description. The Church Grim from Jorks Location, Denmark I heard the stories when I was a child. Stories about the Kierkegrim. It's said to be a spirit that resides over churches, protecting them. When I was young growing up in Denmark, we kids were always told not to stray too far from the house to play and to avoid going outside at night to play if we could. My parents were the worrying type. We lived in a small village that had a number of churches, a couple of them new, while many of them were older, older than even my grandparents. We actually lived quite close to one that had a lot of aspects that me and my friends loved. There was an old graveyard there that made for a great and creepy game of hide and seek. And there were sturdy vines up the north side of the church you could climb and get right to the rooftop. Sure, it was dangerous, but we were reckless kids who knew better than to rat on each other. We just wanted to have fun. But this occasion, it was different, because we'd never played at the church past dark. It was a Sunday night, late into the night. We had school coming up the next day and were late coming back home by a couple of hours. My two friends, R and J, were with me. The three of us had already come to terms with the fact that we were all doomed to being punished when we got home. We were slowly walking the dirt path back when we came across the old creepy church lot. All it took was a glance among the three of us, and we agreed. We had to go check it out and go to the graveyard just to see how creepy it was. We jumped over the rusted, wrought iron gate and raced to the graveyard, because I couldn't stop myself from laughing for some reason. As we were trying to catch our breaths, we suddenly heard something. It was the sound of footsteps and scuffling, and it seemed to be coming from the top of the church nearby. I remember looking up, still with tears of laughter in my eyes and a big smile on my face. When I saw it, all of that disappeared. I saw something that my mind struggled to believe was real. It vaguely resembled a house cat, but it was twice my size. Its skin was as black as the darkness around it, with yellow moon-like eyes that peered down at us. It was walking in a way to make itself known. Then it hissed at us. The sound was more akin to a giant snake than a cat. Suddenly, R yanked me by the arm, and I found myself being dragged along as J and R ran for their lives. I'd never seen them so scared. When we made it out of the church lot and back over the gate, we all looked toward the building. The cat-like creature was still there on top of the roof, but in the course of a few seconds, it faded away, becoming more and more transparent until it was gone from our reality. We ran back home without a word between the three of us. That night, we did not tell our parents because they were already mad. It was only the next day that we ended up discussing the event but only amongst ourselves. We three were sure of it then. We were sure that what we saw was in fact the Kierkegrim, or a church grim. And now we knew that those stories were very, very real. It did not want us at that church lot for whatever reason. 
I encountered the Baka Haste from Ruger J. Location, Greenland. Living in Greenland is cold. I'm sure you would have guessed that, though. One thing you need to know about Greenland is that it can be dangerous, too. People wind up lost, frozen, or underwater in early graves quite frequently. While our scenery is beautiful, unique even, the weather can be harsh at times. Greenland is windy, it's wet, and it's more often than not frozen. The last thing I personally expected, though, was to encounter something here that I thought was a myth. I now fear the water for reasons other than its precarious nature, because there's something here called a bakahist, a sort of water horse that roams in and around the water, and it waits for children. Yeah, it sounds like urban legend nonsense, that's exactly what I would have told you before I saw one myself and nearly fell prey to it. I remember the day clearly. I was going fishing with my dad through marshlands and by rivers, but I'd never been interested in fishing to my dad's disappointment, and I would just end up walking through the wetlands, making the biggest splashes that I could playing pretend like I was a Viking, and other things. Well, eventually, my dad found himself a good spot to fish. He sat there while I did my thing. After a quiet 45 minutes, all of which I had spent wandering through the earthy mush, I finally looked up and realized I could no longer see my father anywhere, and I had no idea what direction I had gone. I was lost. I was only nine at the time, so of course I began to panic. I sprinted through the wetlands, trying to find any sight or trace of my dad. After a few desperate and terrifying minutes, I plopped down into the shallow water and I began to cry. It was then that I heard a weird sound, like a horse whinnying. I looked up with a furrowed brow. A horse out here in the wetlands. That'd be the day, I told myself. When I looked up, it was only a few meters in front of me. A horse, a wild stallion. My mouth flew open and I forgot my worries for a moment. The horse seemed quite friendly too. I began to approach it and it never even flinched or looked away. Instead, it actually trotted closer to me. When I reached out and stroked its white mane, I was beyond ecstatic. I'd never been this close to a horse before. Suddenly, the horse lowered itself in an odd way, and I swear to God I saw a gesture towards its back. This, this horse wanted me to ride it. No questions asked, I began to hike my leg to get on it. When... Ruger! It was my dad. He was shouting like a madman and running towards me in the horse. That was when the horse threw its head to the side, knocking me painfully into the water, then began to gallop away at a ridiculous speed. I didn't know that horses could run that fast. Before I could even be angry with my father for scaring away the beautiful animal, for ruining my experience, I watched the horse's skin and fur turn dark, and I kid you not, the horse jumped headfirst into the water and never resurfaced. My dad carried me home, not answering my many tearful questions until we were back in the house. When we were in the safety of our home, he told me that what I had encountered was a baka haste. A water horse that lured people, especially children, into a watery demise. He said to never go near bodies of water without someone else, and to turn and walk away if I ever saw something like that again. I listened to him. I listened because I knew my father was right. Nothing convinced me more than seeing that creature jump into the water as it changed 
into a murky black monster. Encounter in a Dark Swedish Forest From Thorn Rose Location, Sweden I'm 21 years old and from a small town in Sweden. Some years ago, me and a couple of guy friends from school decided to go into the forest to camp out for a night. It wasn't the first time we did this, but we had never been to this particular spot before. My friends were Phil and Ned. We had chosen to go camping on a warm and sunny Friday in July. We had our parents drop us off at the entrance to the forest trail. Ned had chosen this spot because he had heard his grandfather speak of it before he passed away not too long ago. There was apparently a camping spot with a fire area, and beyond that, there was going to be a small lake. We walked for about an hour on an old gravel road surrounded by thick forest. It took much longer to get there than we anticipated, and being a typical girl, I overpacked. Finally, we made it to the spot, which actually had a small little camping shack with three walls, a roof, and a wooden floor. We walked straight down to the lake after unpacking a bit, then jumped into the water to cool off after such a long and sweaty walk. Phil started a fire while me and Ned carved sticks to grill some hot dogs on. We stayed by the fire all evening and passed around a bottle of vodka that Phil had taken from his parents, and we talked about life and how things were going for us. The sun was beginning to set around that time. Our talking was suddenly stopped when we heard a twig snapping behind us. I froze, not wanting to look behind me. Ned got up and got closer to where the sound had come from and began to laugh nervously. Maybe we got a thirsty rabbit on our hands, he said, as he took a sip from the vodka bottle. He sat back down and we started to relax again, trying to laugh it off. We continued talking a bit longer, until we grew tired. Ned then went to go and relieve himself behind some trees by the shack, and as I stood up from my place to go to my sleeping bag, I heard the sound of someone crying. Petrified. I turned around to look where the sobbing was coming from, and there was another cry. I screamed and ran over to Phil. He was shocked by my reaction because he apparently had not heard the sobbing. Ned came out from the side of the shack and asked what was going on. I explained myself to them as best I could. They went silent and began to listen to the forest around them. The sobbing didn't come again, but now we did realize that there were no sounds coming at all from the forest. It was too silent. I was close to freaking out, but the boys tried to explain it away as my imagination and the vodka. We did not want to stay awake anymore, so we threw the last bit of firewood on the fire and got into our sleeping bags on the cold shack floor. I stayed as close to the others as possible. We all had a hard time falling asleep that night but eventually I did drift off. I then woke up to the sound of Phil whispering in my ear. He said to me, Wake up, there's a girl by the fire. I was too exhausted to understand what he was talking about, but I looked over by the fire anyway. It was dark, and the fire had almost burned out down to ash, and gave the surroundings a faint reddish glow but I did see a little girl's silhouette, illuminated faintly by the glow past the fireplace, just by the spot I had previously been sitting. I looked over at Ned, but he was fast asleep. Then I looked back at Phil, but he just stared at the girl. She had her head in her hands and was wearing a dirty brown dress. Her hair was long, blonde, and messy, and she herself looked to be no more than three years old. We lay there for what felt like forever before Phil stood up and looked at me, signaling me to do the same. I followed his lead and did as he did. 
Now Ned woke up and was just about to say something when Phil signed for him to be silent, and he pointed to where the little girl stood. The silence was again broken by the sound of sobbing coming from the girl, but she had not moved. A cold chill went through me as I realized that it was the same sounds I had heard in the forest before. I wanted to believe that the little girl was just lost, but I knew deep down in my bones that this was no normal little girl. Phil walked closer to her and tried to talk to her. Hi, my name is Phil. Don't be scared. Are you lost? The little girl stopped sobbing and we waited for her to respond. She lifted her head up slowly. I expected to see a deformed looking face to greet us, but she was gorgeous. Until her mouth began to stretch wide open, twice the size of any normal person, and she screamed. I fell backwards and hid my head on the hard, damp floor. I was stunned by the pain and got a splitting headache. When I came to my senses, I was really starting to freak out. But the little girl had disappeared. What the heck was that? I screamed. The boys did not answer me. They were already stuffing their things into their backpacks frantically, screaming that we needed to get out of here. I tried to do the same, but because of the pain in my head, I was not as fast as them. I ended up having to leave some of my stuff behind. But I didn't care, as long as we got out of there fast. We started running down the old gravel road that led to the parking lot. It was pitch dark on that road, which was only lit by the faint light coming from our phones. Ned tripped on something and fell to the ground. We stopped and helped him up to his feet again, but he had hurt his foot on the fall, so we had to slow down. We started to calm down too, thinking that the little girl had not followed us, but we didn't say a word to each other. Phil called his father and begged him to come and pick us up as soon as he could. He was a bit annoyed by being awakened this late, but reluctantly agreed to come. We maybe had 10 minutes left to get to the parking lot when I stupidly looked behind us. I saw the little girl standing there, not even five meters behind us, with her head in her hands. I started crying and the boys did not have to look behind us. I wanted them to know that she was there, because the girl began to sob again, but louder than before. We tried to go as fast as we could and finally got to the parking lot, but Phil's father was not there yet. We were not going to stay there and wait, so we kept on walking until Phil's father met us by the road and picked us up. He drove us back to their house. My mother came soon after Phil's father had called her, and Ned's mother went by to pick us up. I didn't speak about it for a couple of days. My parents were worried, but they didn't press me to talk. I eventually said that we had simply encountered a scary moose that had come into our campsite, and they believed me. They don't believe in strange or supernatural things like ghosts or spirits. But my grandmother did, so I went to her and had her explain to me what she thought it was. She said it was a mealing, a spirit of a child that had perished and was buried without being baptized. Usually the mother of the child had given birth out of wedlock or in secret and ended the child's life soon after. There are apparently a lot of old folk tales about mealings and encounters with them, but usually in old houses where the mothers had buried them under the floorboards. I haven't been back to that forest and I'm not planning to. The Strange Man, from Adam, location, Denmark. It was a seemingly normal day. I was seven years old. I was a scout in Denmark and had scouts on Mondays. When scouts finished at 7.30 p.m., I asked my mom if I could go out in the playground. She said yes, and I quickly ran out alone. I was just playing on the football field when I saw the big swing move a little. I could then see a dark shadow on it, but I ignored it. When I saw it again, being the dumb seven-year-old that I was, 
I ran over to see what was going on. As I came closer to it, a figure became more apparent. It was an old man swinging on one of the swing sets alone. He was going back and forth, slowly. I had never seen him before. He certainly wasn't a teacher, nor one of my friend's dads. He looked to be in his mid-thirties. When he saw me, he said with a faint voice, Hello, Adam. I was scared, but like I said, being the dumb seven-year-old that I was, I said hi back, because that's the proper thing to do, right? Then I asked him his name. He replied, Thomas. Then I walked away. My mom had seen me talking to him, so she quickly dragged me inside with all the other parents and kids. She asked me who it was, and I said that his name was Thomas. He's my new friend, I said. My mom then walked up the stairs, and she looked outside, but Thomas was gone. When we went home, it was about 8 p.m., and I went up to my room and began reading. I was in an okay-sized room, but my bed was on an angle where I could see all of my room. When I was in the middle of reading, I heard something fall. It sounded like a paper falling onto the ground from a high place. I just ignored it. About five minutes later, I heard faint steps walking up the stairs. I just thought it was my mom and ignored it. It was then that a shadowy figure appeared in my room, opening the door slowly. The light switch was next to my bed, so I turned it on in a panic. I was nearly in shock when I saw Thomas. I asked him how he got here. Followed you, he said. After a moment, my mom ran in, and that's when Thomas just faded away. I told my mom that it was Thomas, that he was here. She had this expression on her face when she began to tell me that my grandpa, who had passed away before I was born, was also named Thomas. When I described what Thomas looked like to her, she was even more astonished. Since this day, I'm terrified, but I think that Thomas was simply my mom's grandpa, coming to enjoy the childhood he missed out on, or even coming back to talk to his grandchild. It must have been something... From Elizabeth, location, Sweden. I live in a small town close to a graveyard. It happened about a year ago, one night. I was sitting in my bed while using my laptop. My cats were sleeping on my bed as well, and I was listening to music. Around 8 p.m., I paused it. I forgot to mention that it was storming outside. I took a moment to listen to the wind and rain, but then, out of nowhere, something or someone hit my window two times. It was loud and fast. I stared at my window in shock, and after a minute or two, I went over and opened it, and I looked around. It was too dark to see anything, so I grabbed a flashlight that I keep in my room. I couldn't see anything or anyone that could have hit my window, but then, close to the ground toward the graveyard... I saw eyes. I assumed it was a cat. Then the eyes turned and the animal continued on. I then went to my brother's room and asked him if he had heard anything or anyone, specifically at the window, but he said no. Confused, I went back to my room. Later that night, I was trying to sleep, but I couldn't fall asleep. I just kept thinking about that sound. I then thought that it could have been the kids. The kids sometimes smack my window and run away because they think it's funny. It happens from time to time. But then I thought, why would they do that in the middle of a storm? And what about the eyes? If it were a cat, it would have been scared and ran off when I opened the window. Eventually, I dozed off. The following morning, our power went out. My mother tried to do something about it. And it only somewhat worked, but only in my brother's room. Nothing much happened that day, so fast forward to the night. I couldn't sleep again as I was scared. It felt like something would happen if I fell asleep. 
I don't know how long it took before I finally got some sleep. I woke up in the middle of the night and looked at my window, only to see the same cat-like eyes from before. I stared back at them in horror until they left, and I stayed awake, making sure that nothing else came to my window for the remainder of the night. I don't know what is trying to get in through my window. Maybe it's just trying to bother me, but I'm definitely terrified of it. I hope it doesn't happen again. Should I start believing? From skeptic or not? Location, Finland. It was almost 10 years ago. I was studying theater and acting. During that time, I lived at the school. We had a whole building just for us. We studied upstairs at an old gym hall and lived downstairs. Downstairs had this long corridor where our rooms were on the left side of it. The right side was the living room and the costume studio. At the end of the corridor was a door exiting the building. To the right of the door was the kitchen and to the left was the steps leading upstairs. Many times there you could feel the presence of a large man at the crossroads of the exiting door, the stairs, and the kitchen. Sometimes you could see a shadowy figure standing there. Upstairs, the music player would start playing by itself. Once, we were exiting class when a small ball started rolling towards us, then curved to the right. We tried to replicate the movements of the ball, but couldn't do it. There are two specific creepy moments while I was there that I recall clearly. They both happened on the same day, too. First, I was doing the dishes at the kitchen with my back to the room. Suddenly, I see out of the corner of my eye, someone enters the room and I feel a presence behind me. I was sure it was my next room neighbor, so I asked, What is it? I'll be out of your way in a minute. No one answered, so I turned around only to find the room empty. I went to look for whoever it was and peeked at the living room connecting to the kitchen, but there was no one there. The next experience was when I went back to my room to draw. My desk was sideways to the door. I'm hunched above the paper and see the same silhouette, a girl. She enters the doorway and just stands there waiting. Before I could ask her what she wants, she turns her back to me and starts to walk away. When I raised my head to talk to her, there was no one there. She could not have gotten out by the time I looked up, and I know for a fact that I saw something. These next ones happened a few years later, when I was living alone. In my first apartment, my TV would turn on by itself in the middle of the night, never during the day. A couple of years forward, I was living with my friend. One day, all of our coffee cups just fell out of the cupboard from nowhere. We had been living in that apartment for a while and had no problems like that beforehand. The cupboard was quite sturdy. We never found a good reason for this to happen. Now I'm living alone again. I've had a few horrifying sleep paralysis episodes. I don't know what's happening, but I'm beginning to think something followed me from the school. Something that has latched itself onto me for good. The Woodpecker from Rogue J. Location, Finland. My grandparents have a cabin at the edge of the woods that they pretty much live in during the summer. It's surrounded by farmland on three sides, and the forest starts at the fourth. It's a neat, sparse forest, with the only foliage being blueberries and lingonberries. Very easy to navigate, and full of little paths leading to where you might want to go. A typical forest area. There are train tracks that run through the forest a little less than a kilometer from where the cabin stands. Trains go through from time to time, but it's quite safe to cross, and I've been playing in that forest since I was a child. As you can imagine, animals are plenty there. It's mostly hedgehogs, squirrels, and many, many different birds, though once a bear was reported to be roaming around there. My father is a bit of an amateur ornithologist, though, so the birds always drew our attention. Most of their names I don't know in English, but they're lovely to watch. When I was 17 years old, I was there for pretty much the whole summer. It was my summer job, 
in essence, helping my grandparents with the garden and keeping them company to keep them from driving each other insane. It was simple and sometimes excruciatingly boring, but I think it was good for me. The summer was a warm one with less mosquitoes than we usually get and thus I amused myself by roaming the forest. When I was younger, I wasn't allowed there unsupervised, so I liked to be able to decide where to go and being just with me, myself, and I for a while. I've always been a type of loner. Eventually, mouth and fingers purple from eating too many blueberries, I found myself passing the train tracks. I was too lazy to find the crossing, so I just clambered up the ledge and hopped over to the other side. I never went far with my family, so now I was eager to see how far I could go beyond. The furthest I'd ever gotten was a couple of hundred meters beyond the railroad. The forest was a bit more wet there and mushrooms grew wonderfully in the autumn. I'd walked a good 500 meters away when I heard a sound I'd never heard before. It was almost like a child was screaming or crying behind me. My first reaction, silly as it may have been, was to jump around as though someone was going to attack me. Of course, there was no one there and I soon understood the reason. It was a woodpecker. There is a subspecies of woodpeckers in Finland that make a sound like a woman's scream. It's very rare, and I was excited just by the thought of seeing this elusive bird. It's quite gorgeous, big, almost completely black, with a red spot on its head. The scream sounded again. It was hard to tell where exactly it came from. It sure sounded like it was low to the ground, though, lower than I but the forest can be tricky with the way sound travels. I decided it was probably back towards the cabin and took out my phone to snap a picture of it for my dad. I listened to the scream that was growing in volume as I neared it. My grand aunt had told me a story of how God had turned a rude woman into this bird, cursing her to roam the forest, crying and apologizing for her sins. It of course was just an explanation to why a bird would sound so much like a person. Still, the closer I got, the less convinced I was that it was just a bird and not an actual child. The problem was it sounded too much like a child to be a bird and too much like a bird to be a child. I tried to shut out the mounting anxiety I was feeling, but I couldn't. I've stated I'm a loner. At that age, I was also a terrible overthinker. I really started to understand why the ancient Finns had started coming up with stories to explain things like this. Another thing that disturbed me though was that the pauses between the screams were becoming shorter and shorter, and soon it was pretty much screaming nonstop. And still underneath that, I was hearing a faint sound of the train approaching. I doubled my pace. If it really was a bird, the train would no doubt scare it away. I doubted a child would be on the tracks even by themselves. When I cleared the forest, the sound of the train was quite close. The crossing was there in front of me, and there sat a three or four year old child. She was not wearing any clothes, and she sat there in the middle of the tracks, screaming her bright red face off while tears were running down her cheeks. She didn't sound sad, she sounded quite angry actually as if she was in the middle of a temper tantrum. I was utterly frozen for a second, heart sinking down to my knees. Then I started forward with a yell and the intention of getting her off those tracks before the train hurt her. But she stopped me in my tracks with the next thing she did. She quit crying suddenly, with no hiccups or anything like that. She stood up on her shaky legs. She looked like she was about to bolt, probably down the tracks. I learned it that day. When disaster strikes, I'm one of those unfortunates who do nothing. Someone who needs to be given orders on how to react. Because I suddenly could not move even though I knew that she was going to perish if I didn't. There was something weird about her though. The train was coming fast. They mustn't have seen her. There was no attempt to slow down or stop. She fixed me with an absolutely furious look. Give me a name. She screamed right before the train hit her and she disappeared. The train breezed past and I was left standing there, stunned and afraid. There is a creature in Finnish folklore called Liekio. 
It's the soul of a baby birthed in secret and slain by its mother. They're said to wander the forests and scream and occasionally lead people into danger, like Will-o'-the-Wisps. The way to get rid of them is to give them a name or to dig up their little bodies and bury them properly. I used to think it was just another story to explain that stupid woodpecker, but now I'm not too sure anymore. I don't know for sure, but I think the creature was trying to lure me in front of the train. This encounter haunts me more than I care to admit. I don't go to the tracks anymore, and children in traffic now give me unreasonable amounts of anxiety. It bothers me that if the kid had been just a kid, I would have let her perish. But then it bothers me that had I tried to save her, I would have perished. I do my best not to think about it. Norse mythology is quite rich and vibrant. There's almost always a monster or spirit to explain away the things that go on in people's lives and regions. Things that early people could not understand, but tried to. Then again, maybe it's our mistake thinking that it's just an explanation. Maybe these legends are warnings. Maybe they are notes on creatures that are very real. Spirits that are very dangerous. Good luck out there to those of you who reside in Nordic countries. There's something supernatural going on around you. Good night. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe. If you want to support the show, don't forget you can send us your story at darknessprevails.org. You can also go to patreon.com slash darknessprevails or shop our merchandise at teespring.com slash stores slash darknessprevails. Now, as usual, here are my five favorite early comments from the previous video about seven real boogeyman encounters. L6 says, Your favorite show is Tales from the Dark Side, and mine is Darkness Prevails. Thank you so much for the horror stories while cycling. You're the only one that did that. I love cycling, love your shows, and my birthday is March 27th, so thanks. Well, I hope you had a happy birthday, and I'm glad I could be a part of it. Thanks so much for being a great fan. I hope I can bring you more creepy thrills. Preston Mason then says, listening to your last video now, I'm so behind. Ah, no worries. I'll always be here with more scary stories for you. As long as you come back and binge a few, I'm happy. Platinum Not Gold says, I'll watch this in the morning with some milk and cookies. Everything's better with milk and cookies, my man. Dark Lord says, you should do hellhounds. That sounds like a fun idea. I think I've been suggested that before, but I always forget. And the Punisher243 says, Howdy, partner. My boogeyman whispers naughty things in my ear. Aw, sounds like someone likes you. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Darkness Prevails. But don't worry, more scary stories are on the way soon. So stay tuned. Until next time, here are the credits to my amazing patrons who continue to donate. Remember, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one. <laughs>